Hey everyone, my name is Adam. Thanks for uh, coming tonight to hear Roy Fowler and Mary Heilman speak at Fort Gansevoort. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have met Roy uh, through Mary. Uh, Mary I met in 2002. Roy I, I think I met a, a couple of years ago and I've, I've hung with Mary quite a bit and I always uh, looked uh, and wondered about a, a, a painting that she has of uh, Roy's and finally I uh, yeah, I, I, I asked Mary um, whose work it was and reached out to uh, Roy, and now we uh, have a beautiful show of his work at the gallery. So thank you um, for spending most of the summer making all this beautiful work, and thank you for being my uh, old pal and for introducing me to Roy. And thanks to all you guys for coming out. Um, they're going to speak for a while, and then um, we're just going to invite you downstairs if you want some water or some wine if you're planning on staying for Alexis's talk um, we just yeah we, we prefer that you go downstairs so we can run a lot of the furniture up to the third floor and set up for Alexis's talk which should take place at 8 30 so I'll let these two take over and uh, yeah enjoy but yeah, thank you for coming tonight and um, if you'll Bear with me, I'm just going to try and uh, uh, make a brief statement about um, waves and about why I titled my paintings after constellations. Waves have been around in one form or another since the beginning of the universe. And um, along with other phenomena that we know of, um, light and gravity, for example. And uh, when we think of constellations, we think um, also in kind of a cosmic and distant time frame. And uh, the um, star constellations, they kind of uh, they spark our memories, and we attribute mythological names to them. And I try and align those with uh, the separate, the different characters in my paintings. Um, and ocean waves, I think, have been around since there's been water on our planet. You know, I, as soon as the first rock rose above the surface of the ocean, um, I'm sure there was a wave that was there to crash into it in the form of surf. And um, waves were around uh, during, at the beginning of life, when life issued from the, the steaming vents of the ocean floors. And waves were around uh, for the dinosaurs, for the meteors, for the, uh, the volcanoes. And they're here now in uh, the, um, our age of the Anthropocene age, the age of the, the era of the sixth mass, mass extinction. And uh, they're going to be here when we're gone. So um, it's funny to think of waves in political terms, but um, then, but you know, since they they form in our oceans. Um, we really have a personal connection to them. Um, and because everybody knows that we're 60% water and salt water ourselves. Um, and as you know, as we're hearing from the Native Americans in, in Black Rock, North Dakota, water is life. And when we poison the water, we're poisoning our lives. So I think it's a good thing to pay attention to water and to pay attention to the oceans, um, which are the um, sustain life on our planet. So um, I'd also uh, like to say just a, a word of introduction for our, our guest. Um, in 1986, I asked the curator Fred Hoffman uh, who he was interested in. And he said that um, I should go check out Mary Heilman having a show at uh, her first show at, at her Inns Gallery on the Lower East Side. And I went to see the show, and the paintings there remain amongst my favorites in Mary's catalog of works. Uh, they were red, yellow, and blue, and black and white. And uh, I remember they were really basic, very simple, to a point. But then they refused to um, kind of give up the, the final logic of their construction. 
And uh, it kind of reminded, it reminds me of um, what a friend said of Emily Dickinson's poems, that uh, there's always one line in her poems that is completely abstract and that keeps you from, um, you know, from an easier, complete translation. And so, as a result, ultimately her, her poems are really unknowable. I, I met Mary, I guess she was giving a talk at, uh, and she was describing um, being at a friend's beach house at Miramar Point in Santa Barbara. And uh, they, were, they were able to look right out their windows at the ocean and, and see all the kids surfing. And I approached her after a talk and I, I mentioned that I was probably one of those kids. <laughs> and. Um, you know, I, because I used to spend literally every moment uh, when I was not, when I wasn't at school at the point, uh, either surfing or hanging around the fire, which we had kind of built and kept going to keep ourselves warm in the winter because there weren't any wetsuits in. <laughs> so, um, I, got, I, I have kind of a list of the people that we've kind of talked about over the over that time period in the 1960s, Mary and I, and you know we can talk about them or not. But there, uh, Jeff White, who was nicknamed White Owl, who went to UCSB with Mary, and I, who I knew as a surfboard builder and surf shop owner in Santa Barbara. Richard Serra, who went to UCSB. Reynolds Yader, who is a surfboard builder and fisherman in Santa Barbara. Ocean Beach, San Francisco. Tijuana. Hammonds Reef. The Hawaiian Islands, <laughs> uh, Peter Volkos, who Mary studied with in Berkeley, and uh, Ron Nagel, also in Berkeley, and finally, uh, if he's versus beatniks. <laughs> so, if he's versus beatniks. So, I, um, I asked Mary when we were up, when we were walking up here, if she remember how White Owl got his nickname. He's really tall and really thin and really brown. And blind? Brown. Oh, was he blind? No, he wasn't. I wasn't blind. <laughs> Not blind. He was a surfing. And he kind of looked like a big long cigar. And so they called him White Owl. I think that's why. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's it's just funny to me. He, he was, uh, uh, there were just two people who built surfboards in Santa Barbara then, maybe three. And, you know, he was one of them. And uh, he was, you know, another generation older than I was. And we all, all the kids kind of looked up to him. And uh, we thought, you know, I, I, I always thought it, it was kind of this mystical assignation, you know, white owl, but you know, I didn't find out until I talked to Mary that it was because he was six foot four and he was skinny as a cigar. So, uh. I went to Santa Barbara when I, um, let's see, I got out of high school here, no, no, in San Francisco. And um, I, I was really bad in high school. I got all C's, so I, w I couldn't really get into any college. I wanted to go to Stanford because my mom went there, but no, that wasn't going to happen. And um, so um, I went to junior college for a couple of years, and then I went. To, then I wanted to go to Santa Barbara. I worked really hard at City College and um, got into Santa Barbara in 19 whatever the uh, 50s, like 59 or something, and. Um, and I went to Santa Barbara because this girl that we always took the bus to school with, like the city bus, she's really beautiful tan, and I said, where have you been? And she said, oh, I'm hanging out in Santa Barbara. It's really cool there. Um, and, and there's tons of surfers there. Tons of surfers back in those days it wasn't really that many, you see. Not like now. So I told my mom I wanted to go to Santa Barbara because it was a really good school for education to learn how to be a teacher. And, um, and I got in. So then I went there and um, decided to be an English major. 
and that guy that had the house on the beach was one of the teachers, and we would have class there. Drive all the way down from Isla Vista to Miramar Beach, which was a cool beach for surfing also. Mm -hmm. Then um, when Roy heard me give this talk about Santa Barbara and everything, um, he showed me this picture of him, uh, this little guy on a surfboard, I guess you were seven or something, and he lived right down the road there. Yeah, yeah, I, I started when, um, you know, in Santa Barbara, everyone, half the people who surfed were dentists, and, and so, <laughs> Why? You know, I had a surfing dentist. I think the schedule, something to do with the scheduling, they, got, they had a lot of time off. <laughs> they can make their own hours. And yeah, they were but, really bad dentists. <laughs> yeah, no, just kidding. Yeah, just kidding. Um, so uh, there was a dentist who, um, whose son was a friend of my older brother's, and so that's that's how it came came into my life. The, the dad was a surfer. Uh, his, his son was trying to be a surfer, and my older brother was a surfer, so I would get all my brother's hand-me-down surfboards. Um, we had, like, you know, I think that picture you're talking about, I'm, you know, like this big and on my brother's hand-me-down homemade balsa surfboard that um, it coated with fiberglass and, and didn't sand the edges. So it was, you know, completely sharp and, um, and uh, it was a nightmare. Um, and actually that was my second one. My first one was, um, uh, you know, maybe a five or six foot tall styrofoam board that we got at Sears. And uh, I was thinking, boy, those are really cool. I wish I had one now. They broke really easily, but they were really light. Nice, yeah, I never heard of that. Yeah, so, so that's, that's how it sort of came into my life, through, through the dentist and my older brother. And, and uh, I think even then, guys went to UCSB because it was there was good surf in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and it was it was really good way back then because there were hardly any people out. It wasn't like um, now at all, and the, and the big spot was down the road toward L.A. was Rincon, mm -hmm. which had a big point going out, and people did come from all over to go to that beach. And um, let's see the way it fit in with going to school was, well, I know one, oh, there was one house over in Isla Vista where a few surfies lived, and they would put a sign up, and, and if it said six hot and glassy, that meant it was a good idea to go, go to the beach. Now, I must confess, I was not a surfer. I, um, I tried it, I mean, I wanted to try it, and so I, and I didn't have a car, so I borrowed a board from one of the kids in the school, and carried it down the beach just a little, right near where the school was. And um, they'd only, and so I tried it out, it was really, really hard. Nobody was showing me how or teaching me, because I wanted to just surprise everybody and just be out in a few days jumping up on the board. So I didn't tell people that I was just trying to figure it out. And then, um, Never heard that one. Yeah, and, and you could, I couldn't borrow a board from a guy unless, all guys too, that was the other thing, no girls. Um, unless it was really cold out, because every other time there'd be guy, people going surfing, and a lot of times they didn't go out when it was cold because they didn't have wetsuits then. Mm -hmm. As I would, no, they, no didn't. they didn't. And um, so I gave up. So for me, surfing's a spectator sport. When I was a kid, I body surfed and surfed on a, a map, surf map. But uh, and then when I moved back to New York and started going to the beach in Long Island. Um, the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean is totally different for me from the Pacific. So I'm body surfing, swimming, I mean swimming around, I'm not body surfing. And so there's this big rip that starts dragging me down the beach and I didn't really have any experience with that. And so now I don't go in the Atlantic Ocean too much. Anymore. Yeah, I, I, I hear about the rip, I've never really experienced it here, but I hear that every year people die from the rip. And you know, I have a friend sitting in the back, uh, Paul, who's has told me a story about being carried like for miles down the beach in the Hamptons, and unable to escape the rip. And um, 
Yeah, there's all strategies for getting out of it, but, you know, I didn't get it, so. I was done with the Atlantic. And this isn't so long ago, but, you know, it was a good idea. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's funny because when you mentioned that, you know, six feet hot and glassy, that really was the magic number because that, you know, that meant that, you know, it was probably, even though it, could, it was December, it could be like, you know, 80 degrees in Santa Barbara, and there really are magic days where there's just not a breath of wind and glassy, but, so the, the surface of the ocean is, you know, like glass. And, um, you know, when... You know, somebody asked me the other night uh, here if, if I have all these different blues uh, to describe different water temperatures. And I pretty much said, well, no, I just, I go to the paint store and I try and find the most beautiful blues I can and I use them and, you know, if they, and sometimes they remind me of things, sometimes they don't. But uh, I did find that the cerulean blue uh, Makes, makes hot and glassy, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that um, you know we we both talked about William Finnegan's book, The Barbarian Bays, and his wonderful descriptions of surfers, and um, and I uh, a part of a passage in his book that I really love is is um, him describing just sort of paddling over the top of a giant wave in Hawaii and having the offshore wind blow the top off the wave and, and just all the water showering down on him on the other side. And um, I think cobalt blue can do that. <laughs> so, so there's, there's uh, I think if you're a writer, you really, your job is to make those things happen, to you know, have those descriptions carry weight. And I think if you're a painter, you're kind of lucky when those things happen. They're kind of serendipitous. And uh, when they show up, it's can't necessarily make them happen, but they happen. You know, a lot of times, the waves are brown. That's true. Most of the time, well, it depends on where you are. But um, so I've been trying to, and I do paintings of waves too. Not so much lately, but I have, and um, it's hard, you know. That's one reason I don't do it that much. But um, I've been trying to get that brownish green and then the little blue comes through color and um, so when I get it maybe Adam will show <laughs> get that weird brown that you can see through yeah. yeah but the thing about looking at these that's so brilliant they remind me of Japanese wave paintings too which I love like I guess Hokusai the wave paintings I really have the feeling, like you do in a surf movie, of actually being in there. And if I really chill and meditate and let you know all the distractions go away, I can even feel scared. Um, I love these paintings. I think they're really um, well. They're like words when you see them lined up like this. They feel like you know, that they're saying something. They're not the same. Well, depends on what you're thinking about and how you're looking at it. It could be the same way. But I would love to know, like, how you do them. Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, they, I'll, I'll, um, Tell from the edge that it's not all blue under there. Uh, it, no, it's, it's mostly blue. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I there, just just as, as an aside, uh, there's um, Adam has has uh, found these guys that have this archive of, of surfing magazines upstairs, and um, there's some really old ones, and um, you know, my inspiration kind of comes from. You know, being a kid and, and getting these in the mailbox, uh, and so I, I kind of have one here that um, you know that that uh, you know I found that's like from 1962 or something that I remember, and um, I mean you can 
like this, these color, the colors of the waves are really kind of imprinted on my imagination. And I, you know, I, it took me years to realize it's really the printers <laughs> who are, you know, who are printing the magazines that make those colorful blooms. But I think by then it was too late. And I think that, um, you know, for me, and that's, that's really the inspiration for, you know, how I pick my colors is to just get these nice, beautiful blues, as, you know, as nice as I can. So, you know, I can, you know, often I'll start with uh, like a, an ad in a magazine that where, um, you know, there's a wave in the background and there's like the bathing suits or, or shoes or, you know, something get rid of all that and just end up with the background and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of take it from there. And um, I make watercolors from those and um, uh, I'll, I'll sort of figure out things like um, you know, where the sky is reflecting on the water and uh, you know, the sky color reflects and, and there's other facets of the the chop where you can actually see down through the uh, water and it, the light goes down and reflects, reflects, no, excuse me, refracts off the sand bottom. And that's usually when the waves are really turquoise. And, and so anyway, I'll try and work out those things. Wow. And, um, and then also try and kind of figure out the cropping and, and um, you know, have uh, the composition, I guess, simply put, and um, and kind of translate the um, you know what's photographic realism into like a more gestural arabesque situation that's that uh, lives more in the realm of, of painting, and um, so then I, I've got the watercolors and. And then I, I, I um, you know, and then I make paintings that are this size from the watercolors, and, and the, you know, there there's a process where you, know, you can't really take it directly from watercolor to oil paint because the watercolors are all transparent, and it's just all the different layers do different things that oil paint really can't do. For, and if you can, I'm kind of not interested in that, right? So. Uh, you know, I figure out the shapes and the, uh, the, the different kinds of marks that will describe the situation, and, and um, you know, and then. The do next you take pictures of them? Uh, I of waves. Yeah, uh -huh. I do. And you look at your pictures. Yeah. Yeah. I, <coughs> that's good. I yeah. Bet. That's what I do too. Yeah, I take pictures and. Uh, I mean, it's fun now with, with uh, the digital cameras. You can you can kind of be a terrible photographer and kind of edit it. Up. Yeah, <laughs> make, make something that, that sort of works. But, you know, and then you know, finally I'll, I'll enlarge them into the paintings that are like they're up on the top floor. I love living at that one of mine. Um, it's it's well bigger, about half again as big as one of these, I think. And it's it right in my where I'm sitting all the time. Not in my studio. It's in my living room, like house in the country. And um, I love looking at it a lot. <coughs> and it actually, yeah, it stays alive. It keeps moving for me because it moves in my. Oh yeah, that's an interesting thing. I'm looking at these and I'm uh, imagining what it would, how it was moving before, how it is now, and what it's going to do next. The way like this could keep me happy all day. I wouldn't have to do anything else except look at these waves. And um, and it, it sort of like goes along with meditating in a way because it just takes over and you don't start really thinking about anything else. Same thing with the other one. People are always coming in and then getting, getting into it and having a lot to say about it. But um, um, the, the way it is like really moving even though it's just sitting there on the wall, I like about these one at a time. Well, looking at all, whatever, six of them at once, um, yeah, that's another whole other thing. 
and, and another big memory of mine from Santa Barbara was the surfing movies. That, and so I'm there like in the 60s, early 60s, the beginning of surfing movies. And so guys would come and one guy I remember, this is all I remember, and it was in some little rec room, rec center in the basement. We're all crowded in there. The movie is black and white. And the guy stood in front of it and, and told the story of what we were looking at uh, while the movie played. It was amazing. And it was a really cool scene. There were a whole lot of, mostly guys. So like, that's another thing I liked about it. <laughs> Surfing yeah. movies. Yeah, well, they came, um, uh, they, those were big events. Like, they came and we would see them in the high school auditorium. And you're right, the, the guys who made the surfer, the surf movies, um, one of them was the guy who made this surfer magazine. They would come and they would stand in front of the audience and, you know, um, it was just, you know, the screen would go up and it would inevitably start with like some giant crashing wave from Hawaii, which none of us, you know, had ever, as kids, had ever been, <laughs> ever seen. Yeah. And, really high. Yeah, and, and there would be these tiny little surfers just sort of falling and crashing into well, each I other. I there when I was there. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, yeah. And so we would all just freak out, and we were so scared that by the end of the movie, we were so excited to go surfing. And then we'd go out, and, you know, you know like especially in summertime, Santa Barbara is all fog and no surf. <laughs> <laughs> so we would come out of the movie theater and it was such a come down, uh, mm -hmm. you know. To wait till September, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the water then, got warm too. Yeah, and then as we grew up, we figured out, well, we can just go it's to working. Hawaii and get in, you know. Go over to Hawaii, yeah. yeah. And find those waves and learn how to surf them. Yeah, because all Southern California is, is kind of not happening in the summer. Even if you go to San Diego. And, yeah, there, there, there's places, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. Um, oh, I know. You had a big brother, so did he subscribe to those surfing magazines? We both did, oh. right, right from the first issue on. Even when you were little, you still what? Well, they started in about 1960, I think, and yeah. so I was maybe eight. Eight. And, uh, yeah. Uh, it's and hard. then you went out when you were eight? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, and they, jump up on board as a little guy? Yeah, well, you know, I started on, um, you know, a lot of people are probably familiar with those canvas rafts that kind of have pontoons, the four pontoons, and they're, yeah. you know, about this big. They're like a mattress. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I learned how to surf by um, standing up on those and oh, riding the waves. Oh, you stood up on it? Yeah. Oh, neat. And I went, you know, I thought for years, did I really do that? How did I do that? Yeah, and that's then, a good question. Yeah, and, but then, you know, my family finally sent me this picture, and, you know, even though the, you know, the mats are about as big as one of these paintings, I was like, you know, one quarter of the size of the mat, so, you know, I was this big, so it was really, I would get on the mat, I wouldn't even make a dent in it. So, oh, I see, you yeah. get right on top of it. Yeah. Well, that's a good image, that's great to think about. And you see, you don't see little guys like that on, on beaches very much anymore. Maybe you find a beach where they are, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think they do. Yeah. You know, especially in Hawaii, um, they, yeah. you know, the kids are, are so young when they're surfing now, and they're so good by the time they're 10 or 12 years old that it's just On boards, not mats. <laughs> on boards. Yeah, yeah, just as, yeah, in circles around the older guys. But you know, it's it's also a nice way you remember <coughs> saying you could watch these forever because that's kind of what it's like to actually be on the beach and like I could just watch waves forever. Uh -huh. You know, it, there's something about it like just trying to and I think William Finnegan kind of talks about that too, like how you know you you can look at one surf spot and kind of get to know it for your whole life, like seeing what it does at a high tide or a low tide or in the winter or in the summer or when there's sand comes in, there's just there. It's kind of neat way to grow up. Yeah, it always, they always change and, and you know, you accumulate that knowledge and that's... See, and that's, you can hear it, the beautiful sound. Yeah. yeah. We lived in San Francisco where it's really cold and um, 
and there was a whole scene about that in San Francisco. The sound, I'm remembering how cool the sound was, or how loud the sound was. Did he take you to the beach with him? Yeah, we went. And, and actually, this is something they did. It was a big thing, like a great big pillowcase, and they'd, they'd put it in the water, and then they'd shake, and then they'd run down the beach and fill it up with air, and uh, use that to surf on. Oh. You never saw that? No, I never saw that. You never saw it. I'm not I making that I've, up. No, I've, I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. Oh, you have heard of it. Good. It's what? So, I want to know what kind of bathing suit you have for. Daddy, what's a uh, good question? It would be like a, some kind of wool, maybe, and, uh -huh. and tight, like underpants, you know? Just the shorts, not, not the full? No. Oh, no. It was after that. And it wasn't, sh it wasn't boxer shorts. It was a tight bathing uh -huh. suit. Like what, what you wear to race. Well, I mean, you guys should know how awesome that is that her dad did that because it is effing cold in San Francisco. I mean, the, um, the water temperature there is frigid, and to go out in your bathing suit. Is, no, uh, no, no. And he was a redhead, so he's all white <laughs> and freckly all over. Oh, this is me. And then one time, the three of us, my brother and me and my mom, were sitting on the beach. And he didn't show up for a long, long time. And it was because he got caught in, and he didn't call it a rip then, he called it a, anyway, he got pulled out. And uh, he did get no lifeguards, nothing like that. He got back. I don't think he went anymore after that. <laughs> and then we moved to LA. And then um, I never saw my dad surf in LA. But we did, my brother and I. Well, you know, I was, I was just reading recently that your dad was an architect. No, he was an engineer. Oh, an engineer. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. We moved to L.A. For, for him to build tunnels and bridges. And it was in the 40s, right after the war. And, um, and that's a good story. It was really, really fun living in L.A. Did you ever think of going into family business? Yes. I told my daddy when I was about eight or something I wanted to be an architect and he said, no, 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 no. girls can't do that. Yeah. And he was pretty right. He said they just make you sit in an office in a great big room um, drawing plans. So I, t I gave up that idea. But he's always looking at houses and buildings in L.A., driving around. It was amazing. Yeah. I don't know this, but my, my grandfather was an architect, and my mother's two brothers were, and my stepdad was his too, and so, I mean, I kind of thought of going in that business too, and I did spend a summer inside drawing plans. Oh, at a job, you got a job. At a job, yeah, you know, like, you know, when I was in high school. And, uh, the, the hard thing about being an architect yeah. <laughs> is you, you have to deal with the people you're building the building for. The house. I mean, you wouldn't. We think, oh, I want to build a house, but um, yeah, you have to be a diplomat to be an architect. I would. Do any of you guys have anything to say or ask or what? I know you two went to Hawaii together, yeah. in like 1990-1991, and I'd love to hear a little bit about that trip. Okay. Yeah, we, tw we went on two trips. One, the first one, the two of us went. The next one, uh, you came along too, right? Yeah. Around '95. And yeah. uh, Andy Bartle. I just, I know Mary right. made made paint like little watercolors oh, yeah. of that trip. And I, were you surfing the whole time, Roy? Like I've been dying to know. <laughs> no, I was making watercolors. Were you making too. them too? <laughs> yeah. 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 We were because we had this really yeah, we cool were... place to stay right on the water. Uh huh. Yeah, and that that was. Uh, Winter, like Christmas, New yeah. Year's, 1994 and 95. That's and, right, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, we had a place right on the water on the north shore of Oahu. And um, yeah, we'd, we'd uh, make watercolors. It was a perfect spot to paint, you know, because the ocean was just right there. And it was pretty then you went in once in a while. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I've been in every day. Yeah. I, and I would steal the rent car. <laughs> <laughs> we had one car. For everybody, right. Yeah. Um, it's in January is when they have the con surfing contest for the big waves in Hawaii down in um, Waimea Bay. 
and that was one reason. Although the, the, the where they get the waves is so far out that you really can't see from the beach, right? I don't remember being able right, to yeah. see very well. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it, that was fun though. I wouldn't mind going back there. You've been back. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, you guys go. You know, we we found the place because Mary's niece went to school with someone in, who lived in Hawaii. Yeah. You know, and she kind of put this up. And um, and then when we went back the following year, uh, a friend of Mary's niece by then had bought this house, a beach house that turned into a, a you know they used it as a rental, and we were the first ones to rent it. And um, yeah, Melissa came along, and, and Andy Carlin and his brother Chris, and we all uh, shared this. Yeah, I remember that. That was good. And I go back every year now that you know our friends have moved into the house that was a rental and, and um, you know, I don't know if you remember but that for, on our first trip uh, they had just had their first child and, and uh, they were celebrating his one year birthday which is kind of a big deal in Hawaii and uh, so they had this huge party and all the, like surfers like Peter Cole and, yeah. and uh, you know, her, her dad's Hawaiian so they are a lot of Hawaiians. And he's in Yale now right? Uh, Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of those. Yeah. 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 Three boys have grown up, and, and it's really fun because I'm Uncle Roy, and I, I just love getting like the Facebook messages, you know. Hey, Uncle Roy. Yeah. So, yeah, nice. I thought that was interesting what you said about um, that uh, one of the viewers was saying that the different paint color suggested the temperature, and. Um, not being a surfer, of course, there's a whole other way of looking at these paintings as a phenomenon of nature, and it, it doesn't have to do with experiencing what surfing is, but it has to do with experiencing sort of the ongoingness of nature and that um, the kind of the amazing force of it and um, participating in that. So the temperature thing to me, it really makes a lot of sense. Like the, there's one. In the, uh, like this one, it seems to me it's a cold place. It's a colder water. Um, and so just experiencing the, the kind of, uh, that the color suggests an actual physical sensation of the viewer. Yeah. Of the viewer that's not necessarily, you know, a surfer thinking about what it's like to be in the barrel, but, but a person who's looking at these as, um, as a sort of iconic form, you were talking about constellations. These are both real iconic forms in our, in our consciousness, that spiral form, the, the continuation of the spiral. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was interesting that, that somebody made that observation. Yeah, that's good. I, yeah, I love these. I can just, it's like a movie, actually. It's not like they're still. And I'm thinking one at a time, although I do get into looking at them as like a bunch of different breaks in the same spot. Well, you know, I, um, I remember uh, going to the, the show of Andy Warhol's shadow paintings at the Heiner Friedrich Gallery on West Broadway. Do you remember that? Yeah. And uh, Andy Warhol was there signing autographs, <laughs> and um, I, was, I was kind of too young and shy to ask for one, but uh, I had kind of never forgotten how the, those paintings just wrapped all the way around the gallery, and I just, I don't know, I guess somehow, I don't, it's just somehow in my consciousness, and, and it's probably shaped, it's probably shaped things, uh, uh, or, or, yeah, oh. in the way I, the way I, we have worked on a lot of occasions. And this is cool looking at this these, this way in a line like this. And then, you know, upstairs too. And as far as the water temperature, I think that may be true, but I can never figure out which ones are the warm ones and which ones are the cold ones. So I, well, that comes I don't think goes. it matters, but I think yeah. that's, that's an interesting and thing to say because yeah. um, it has to do with looking at it as actual water rather than looking at it as a wave. Do you know what I mean? The, the, I mean, so it takes it outside of being a surfing phenomenon to being 
a force of nature phenomenon, which I guess surfing is too, but. That's um, right. Yeah, the surfer is in yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. You got to put them there. Or you put yourself there. And that happens as you hang with them. Well, I think also it's, it's sort of, uh, again, a way to be close in on something that you would never be close in on. I mean, there's That's right. not any way that, you know, I'd be swimming around right here. Yeah. So uh, the, the idea, you know, again, it becomes this sort of like large cosmic thing, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, a, like the constellation or something. It's just that you don't necessarily see yourself in relation to that because it's, uh, its scale is of a magnitude that's very extreme both visually and philosophically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's a big idea. And kudos to the surf photographers who are really the first ones to make this this kind of image. And and mm -hmm. you know one thing I liked about these is working with these is that um, this image just showed up in the mid 20th century. You know, it wasn't around before then. So it's really those guys who would just swim out in the water with their cameras. Um, Photograph uh, surfers who really, you know, that, that's when you started seeing these things. So, uh, yeah, that really, you know, think of these as a tribute to those guys. And, and speaking of, um, Adam has um, managed to get a really great surf photographer, uh, Jeff Devine, who has been photographing. Uh, I think he's now the, uh, you know, the photographic editor for one of the magazines, and he's been around since the 1970s, 60s, 70s, um, shooting really great photographs. And he's going to give a slideshow and a talk here um, in about a week. So. Um, uh, he's, he's kind of had a style that we all knew. Um, he would, he would shoot the. The bonsai pipeline, and he always had a rainbow <laughs> that went over the, the whole lineup. And all his that editors. he put in every time? Well, that, that was sort of his, his uh, trademark. Uh -huh. And all the, the editors would kind of roll their eyes and go, oh yeah, another jet Because <laughs> <laughs> he put it in with Photoshop. No, no, no. This, oh, he'd this, always get a rainbow. This was the 70s, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And in Hawaii, there's. Oh, in the 70s, right. We didn't have any Photoshop. Photoshop. Yeah, and, and besides, rainbows are kind of. They happen all. Oh, they do. Yeah. Okay. Duh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hey, boy. In this one, I can imagine that I'm looking up from underwater. For some, oh. maybe it's the maybe it's the scale of the of the shape. Yeah, I could see that. I could go there. Yeah. You see that once in a while, right? Uh, I kind of know what you mean. Like maybe. Like with the so, being the, the so that would be light coming from water. Like uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, it, it, uh, Oh, a little hole of light yeah. while you're under the water. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, that happens. Oh, wow, that's yeah. I like that. Get dizzy. Maybe some more. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a whole different perspective. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking up instead of sideways. Mm -hmm. Nice. You gotta read this Finnegan book because that happens. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and also another plug for Adam's gallery that uh, William Finnegan is going to be reading here uh, on November 9th, I think, uh, the day after the election. You better get here really early. <laughs> so, Jackie, what were you going to say? Uh, you had mentioned earlier you were thinking about the sound of the wave. Yeah. And. In these paintings, and I think about your work, there is something very sort of, you uh, used the word cosmic before, something very experiential about them. And I've never spoken to you about the, where sound fits into your relationship to painting. Do you, for instance, listen to anything in the studio when you're working? Do you think of certain sounds? Yeah, I do. Not so much lately for some reason. Um, but um, music is a big part of my thinking. And um, a lot of the paintings are about music, so I listen to a lot of music and think about it a lot. Um, I don't listen to music all the time the way I used to, which is weird. I, I've just kind of gotten um, into a different kind of silent space. 
but often I'm thinking about it even though I'm not hearing it. And the, uh, the logic of how stuff is um, uh, uh, full at some place and then empty and, and um, a lot of that logic is, um, relates to uh, pauses and, and movement in music. Yeah. I really love the, the geometry in your paintings and how that. It's big into geometry. Yeah, and how that uh, manifests itself in waves. It's so crazy, yeah. Oh, and yeah, and, it's, and curved geometry is really a cool kind of geometry, too. And I can sit there in the studio for like hours working <coughs> out the alleged math to do something, and uh, I think I'm not crazy. Yeah, because I do eventually do something. So you actually work with numbers and portions no, and no, just shapes and sometimes I I get out a ruler and, and measure stuff to see long and short and that type of stuff. But uh, like I know you have like uh, paintings with even squares and squares that are you know kind of more overt in the in the work. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's kind of like looking at these and looking at the math in these, which is all about curves. You, you used to have uh, the grid more, more uh, prominent or visible. Yeah, um, yeah, I would kind of see through more, and I, I just let it, I just let it. <laughs> and oh, there's a grid under there? Yeah, I mean it's just it's a practical grid. It's it's you know an enlarging grid. Um, that's how I go. Oh, because you got some little ones to start with. Yeah, that's pictures. how I go from the watercolors oh. up to the you know to the big paintings. It's just an enlarging grid. I didn't grid. know that. That's good to know. Yeah, and the, the grid's still in the watercolors, um, and it, it's still amazing. It's a big kind of but having the grid there, uh, I I guess I've kind of gotten to. There's all the squares on the grid, and I kind of paint each square separately, so it's like, you know, making a bunch of small paintings. So you make it disappear? I guess, or sometimes it kind of makes it come there even more. Ah, I didn't know about that part. But you really actually cheated. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Start from scratch. And then just you know, make a big thing and just all at once. There's studies and I work, I work from the studies. And like the ones upstairs, they take about a week to just you know, painting all day, every day to make them. Hey, why don't we casually go upstairs and then? and not be formally sitting here anymore, but kind of wander around a little bit. Good idea, Adam, and then... Maybe downstairs first? Downstairs yeah. better? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it'd be fun I, to I look mean, at... If, if you guys want to take a quick run through upstairs... Look around up here. There's a, there's a projector in front of uh, Roy's uh, center painting for Alexis's. Um, oh, Alexis is going to be yeah. upstairs. Yeah. More than, if, if, yeah. if you can quickly run through upstairs and then make your way downstairs just so we can move the furniture up from the second Oh, you're moving this. Yeah, you, you can run upstairs. No, no, no. You, 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 oh, okay. 30 minutes. That's All fine. right. Yeah, we have time. Feel free to walk upstairs and it's nice to see the, the large paintings as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you, guys.